Hi there. My name is Christopher Wolf. I'm president of the American Public Philosophy Institute. I teach constitutional law here at the University of Dallas. And uh, this is one of our uh, fall speaking events. Uh, we are, let's see, I don't think we have anything actually publicly scheduled now until the spring. The end of January, we're going to have an event where we bring in three relatively, relatively new federal district court judges. We're going to describe, you know, going through the confirmation process and, you know, kind of they're getting up to speed with uh, uh, being, being federal judges. Uh, they're interesting guys and it, it should be a very interesting event. So that'll be it's actually it's the Friday after classes begin. I think that might be the, the 22nd, something like that, 21st or 22nd of January. We also have uh, uh, a major conference coming up in the spring in April. I think it's April 15th and 16th. It's a conference that was originally scheduled for last spring, and it's on liberalism and Catholicism. And yep, there it goes, as expected. So uh, that'll, and that will be bringing in some nationally known speakers for that. So uh, you will also probably have some speakers at the, you know, one at the end of February, one at the end of March as well. So uh, if you wanna kind of follow things and what we're doing, our website is www.appii.org, American Public Philosophy Institute, Inc.org, okay? There's actually a story behind that, but I, I don't even want to say anything about it. So uh, you can imagine if that's something to do with the internet, what it has to do with. So uh, tonight we're very, very fortunate to have uh, Diana Schaub uh, speak for us. Uh, Diana teaches at Loyola University, Maryland. She's been there for about three decades. She's also a visiting scholar at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington. Her work is focused on American political thought and history, and especially Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, African-American political thought, Montesquieu, and the relevance of core American ideals to contemporary challenges and debates. She received her BA from Kenyon College and then an MA and a PhD in political science from the University of Chicago. Uh, with her background in political philosophy, she's lectured on many topics, has contributed chapters to multiple books, uh, edited, uh, edited a book, co-editor of a book called What So Proudly We Hail, The American Soul in Story, Speech, and Song, co-edited with Amy and Leon Cass, two great teachers at the University of Chicago. Her monograph, Emancipating the Mind, Lincoln, the Founders, and Scientific Progress, is based on her 2018 Walter Burns Constitution Day lecture for AEI. She's also been a pres uh, member of the President's Council on Bioethics. Uh, I've heard her speak twice before on matters relating to Lincoln. And I have to say they're, they're two of the best lectures I've ever heard. And so I'm looking forward to having her tonight. Can I just encourage you all to uh, give her a very warm welcome with your faces since you're all masked, right? <laughs> Um, so if you could give her as much facial feedback as possible, right, and listen very closely so that you have good questions at the end of it. Um, how many of you are politics majors? Um, and how many of you have taken David Upham's class on Lincoln? Um, oh, two. Okay, not, I thought there was going to be more. And how many of you are currently taking American Civilization and will be doing Lincoln and Douglas in American Civilization? Okay, so that's kind of the crowd. <laughs> Good. So it's not just smiling with your eyes. You can, you know, scowl and uh, furrow your brow and uh, all those sort of things that show that you're show that you're thinking. Uh, all right. So I'm delighted to be here uh, to talk about uh, two of my heroes, and I hope your heroes too, Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. Uh, what I'm going to focus on is what one of them, Frederick Douglass, had to say about the other, Abraham Lincoln. Any man can say things that are true of Abraham Lincoln, but no man can say anything that is new of Abraham Lincoln. That observation was made by Frederick Douglass in his great oration in memory of Lincoln, delivered in 1876, upon the occasion of the dedication of the Freedmen's Monument. It's still the case today 
Not even by resorting to lies and untruths can one find anything new to say about Abraham Lincoln. The truths and the untruths, and maybe most common, the half-truths, have all been around a long time. The task is thus not to be original in one's appreciation, but to be just. Proper appreciation of Lincoln's statesmanship, particularly during his lifetime, was rare. Think of the contrast with George Washington. Uh, although both experts and ordinary citizens now routinely consider Washington and Lincoln the greatest uh, of American presidents, Washington's rank as a statesman was clear and uncontested from the beginning, so uncontested that his election to the presidency was unanimous both times. While the election of Lincoln was so contentious as to provoke a civil war. Now, in addition to the seditious opposition of the South, Lincoln encountered plenty of loyal opposition in the North, not only from Democrats, but from those more radical than he, both within the Republican Party and within the various strands of abolitionism. Radicals, then and now, have been particularly stinting in their praise of Lincoln. Uh, some today suggest that the credit for emancipation belongs more to those like Frederick Douglass, who pressured Lincoln to take that decisive step. At the extreme, this position asserts that Lincoln was anti-Black, that the proclamation, the Emancipation Proclamation was basically a fraud, uh, and that Lincoln does not deserve any credit for emancipation since he was forced into glory. Now, before signing on to that contemporary radical critique, we might want to examine what the greatest of the abolitionists himself had to say about Lincoln. Uh, from his newspaper editorials uh, before and during the war to his speeches and personal reminiscences after the war, the trajectory of Frederick Douglass's thinking about Lincoln is one of increasing and deepening appreciation. Uh, often revising his own earlier negative assessments. Uh, perhaps because Douglas was self-educated, he remained a lifelong learner. He was capable of uh, open-minded and rigorous reconsiderations. Uh, the way in which this exercise of his critical faculties could lead him to substantive revaluations was evident early in his career when he dramatically changed his opinion uh, about the status of slavery under the Constitution. Uh, he had begun as a Garrisonian. Uh, the Garrisonian abolitionists believed that the Constitution was a pro-slavery document. Uh, but Douglas eventually broke from that view and embraced an anti-slavery interpretation of the Constitution. Uh, and that act uh, transformed him from a revolutionary uh, intent on annulling the Constitution to a reformer. I mean, he always remained fiercely critical of American practice uh, wherever he thought that practice was deficient. But uh, ever after, he was a staunch defender of America's founding principles. So I, I think that a parallel but more subtle shift uh, occurred as a result of Douglas's encounter with Lincoln. Uh, it's an encounter that taught him to appreciate the statesman, uh, which is to say the prudent, politician, uh, as well as to appreciate the John Browns of the world. So Douglas learned to love Lincoln. And in this address that I'm going to be examining, the uh, 1876 oration in memory of Lincoln, he recapitulates that intellectual and emotional journey for the benefit of all Americans. Uh, so this was a ceremonial occasion. Right. They were unveiling this uh, statue to Lincoln. Uh, and as a result, Douglas's speech uh, expresses gratitude towards Lincoln. But more intriguingly, it, the speech reflects on the political significance of gratitude. It's a speech both of gratitude and about gratitude. Douglas says that the sentiment of gratitude, which perpetuates the memories of great public men, is one of the noblest that can stir and thrill the human heart. Further, he points out that with the dedication of the Freedmen's Monument, uh, remember, this was a monument that was funded by donations raised among the newly emancipated race. 
Uh, it began with a, with a woman, Charlotte Scott, who gave the first $5 that she earned in freedom uh, to the building of a, uh, of a memorial to Lincoln. Uh, so what, what Douglas draws attention to is that Black Americans are now, for the first time, he says, in the history of our people, joining in this high worship. Douglas wants the world to notice what we, the colored people, are doing in honoring Abraham Lincoln. As he explains, first things are always interesting, and this is one of our first things. So Douglas presents the Black commemoration of Lincoln as an act that honors the honorers almost as much as it honors the honoree. Now, the story of how the Freedmen's Memorial uh, took the shape that it did uh, and Douglas's role in ensuring that his people's first national act came off well, uh, it's a fascinating story. Uh, Douglas was asked in 1865, in other words, almost immediately after the assassination of Lincoln, Douglas was asked to lend his name to the Educational Monument Association. This association proposed to raise money from blacks and whites in order to build a black college in honor of Lincoln's memory. Douglas refuses to participate in the project. Uh, and here's the letter uh, explaining himself that he wrote to the organizers. Quote, for a monument by itself and upon its own merits, I say good. <clears throat> for a college by itself and upon its own merits, I say good, but for a college monument or for a monument college, I do not say good. The whole scheme is derogatory to the character of the colored people of the United States. It looks to me like an attempt to wash the black man's face in the nation's tears for Abraham Lincoln. I am for washing the black man's face that is educating his mind, for that is a good thing to be done. And I appreciate the nation's tears for Abraham Lincoln. But I am not so enterprising as to think of turning the nation's veneration for our martyred president into a means of advantage to the colored people and of sending around the hat to a mourning public. <laughs> let, that, let that sort of sink in for a minute. Uh, Douglas doesn't want gratitude, which he calls one of the holiest sentiments of the human heart. He doesn't want that gratitude to be contaminated with blatant self-interest, for gratitude isn't even gratitude then. So in this proposed college monument, the problem of impure motives would have been even worse, since there wouldn't just be a mixture of motives, but actually a division of motives along racial lines. Whites would be doing the creditable giving and blacks the self-interested taking. Douglas does not want his people, doesn't want black people to enter upon citizenship in that way. Instead of an ennobling display of black gratitude, which would elevate the givers, uh, and moreover, elevate the givers in the minds of white observers, the college monument idea would reduce Blacks primarily to the role of recipients. Now, Douglas was not in principle opposed to the idea of white philanthropy uh, on behalf of Blacks. Years earlier, he had sketched a plan for an industrial college in answer to an inquiry from Harriet Beecher Stowe. Uh, she'd written to him saying, what could she do to assist in the project of Black advancement? But Douglas was always very sensitive to the dangers of ill-timed or overly intrusive assistance, which could have the perverse effect of sapping Black initiative and thereby actually impeding the long-term prospects of the race. So Douglas worried that there was always more of benevolence and pity rather than straightforward justice in white America's dealings with blacks. His preference was for justice, 
sternly and blindly equal with no special pleading, no special privilege. Now, this leads to what at first might seem a contradiction in Douglas's reaction to the Monument College project. Uh, as is well known, I think, Douglas's uh, fundamental vision for America was uh, integrationist, uh, radically integrationist. Nonetheless, he wants the monument to be exclusively a black effort. However humble, he says, it should be our own act and deed. On the other hand, when it comes to the idea of a college, Douglas speaks against not only the self-serving hybrid of a monument college, but also against the idea of any college being built for the permanent and exclusive use of Blacks. Now, given the discrimination of the day, Douglas admitted the need for temporary recourse to what he called complexional institutions but he didn't want to see the founding of any institution that accepted the permanence of segregation, that made its peace with, the, with, with segregation. Uh, as he says, the American people must stand each for all and all for each without respect to color or race. So he's in favor of a separately erected monument to Lincoln, but he's opposed to a separate Lincoln College. So why a Freedman's Memorial, but not a Freedman's College? What accounts for the different judgments on these two endeavors? The explanation, I think, hinges on the nature of the two undertakings and their potential contribution to either lessening racial prejudice or prolonging it. A display of gratitude by Black Americans reflecting the special sentiments that they bear towards Lincoln would undercut white prejudice by showing blacks to be capable of the holiest sentiments of the human heart. Conversely, a college explicitly and exclusively reserved to blacks, whoever pays for it, by accommodating race prejudice, in effect, bolsters it. Thus, Douglas accepts all black institutions only with great reluctance and always with the proviso that as fast as circumstances permit, blacks must make their way into the majority institutions. So I think Douglas is consistent in that he judges instances of racial solidarity or group action by their effect on friendship between the races. His guiding question is always, does the doing of this deed point us toward the overcoming of race prejudice and contribute to an ethos of common citizenship? Acts of black self-reliance, both individual and group-based, can create the conditions for non-racial brotherhood. Douglas understood that before the black man could be recognized as a brother, he must first be recognized as a man. Manliness precedes fraternity. Or if we wanna put this in a non-gendered formulation, independence precedes friendship. As Douglas had hoped, the Monument College plan was abandoned. And in the end, the memorial took the pure form that he had recommended. Uh, and Douglas himself was tapped to deliver the keynote address. Uh, what I'm gonna do is just sort of take us through that, through that speech. Uh, not surprisingly, the first paragraph of the address refers to the manly pride with which blacks should view the occasion. And the final paragraph sets forth the black claim to human brotherhood. In between that opening invocation of manliness or independence, and the closing invocation of brotherhood or friendship, the speech itself demonstrates how a still divided nation could develop a shared perspective on the achievements of Abraham Lincoln. 
Now, any analysis of the speech uh, must take into account not only the uniqueness of the occasion, but the rhetorical dilemma that's posed by the larger historical moment. Speech is given in 1876. Uh, that date should maybe ring some bells. Uh, that's when the reconstruction period is coming to an end. The federal government has shown itself to be increasingly reluctant to enforce the 14th and 15th amendments throughout the conquered South. Uh, Douglas was rightly worried about the resurgent spirit of the old South. Douglas worried that reconciliation between Northern whites and Southern whites would end up excluding the freedmen, the former slaves. Uh, and thereby erase the real meaning of the Civil War and, and the real meaning of the victory in the Civil War. So he's trying to use the memory of Lincoln in order to counteract that dangerous tendency. He's trying to revive the new birth of freedom. The oration uh, has a very careful structure. It's composed of eight distinct sections. Uh, and each of those sections begins with what grammarians call a vocative expression. Uh, in the first two sections, he addresses friends and fellow citizens. And in the subsequent six sections, simply fellow citizens. Now, Politicians, of course, often rely on direct address of this sort. Uh, sometimes it even becomes a kind of verbal tick. Uh, Lyndon Johnson, right, he was from Texas, uh, had that Texas accent, which I can't imitate. But if you listen to any speeches by Lyndon Johnson, he's just constantly peppering them with, you know, my fellow Americans. Uh, John McCain, too, uh, had a kind of verbal tick like this, you know, my friends. But Douglas's iterations, every time he has one of these vocative expressions, I think they're much more deliberate and they signal new phases of the argument, uh, an unfolding argument that delineates the different but not irreconcilable claims of whites and blacks to the memory of Lincoln. All right. so. We're gonna, we're gonna go through these eight sections. Uh, Douglas begins the oration by addressing his immediate audience. Uh, those who assembled that day in Lincoln Park, due east of the Capitol building on the 11th anniversary of Lincoln's assassination. The audience was a very large audience and a racially mixed audience. Uh, there were 25,000 ordinary citizens along with numerous representatives from official Washington. Douglas mentions the presence uh, of uh, members of the House of Representatives and the Senate, presence of the Supreme Court, the, the Chief Justice and the, all of the members of the Supreme Court and the president himself, Grant. Uh, so Douglas knew that this was a unique occasion for him. Uh, this would be the largest audience, uh, the most official audience that he would ever address. Uh, and the, the address was published and went out nationwide. Okay, so he really is speaking both to that immediate audience and to a nationwide audience. But he begins by speaking just to the immediate audience. And those who are in attendance deserve to be called not just fellow citizens, but friends. Right? Their attendance gives evidence of their sympathies. And interestingly, in this first section of the speech, Douglas makes no mention at all of Lincoln. Instead, he congratulates you, a pronoun that seems to refer initially only to Douglas's fellow Blacks. And so he speaks of our condition as a people uh, and the progress in that condition. The evidence of progress, Douglas says, is a credit to American civilization. And that provides the occasion for him to, uh, to make a shift and to then congratulate all. Douglas notes that this new dispensation of freedom has come both to our white fellow citizens and ourselves. 
The second section of the speech acknowledges especially the federal government and its friendly role in this new dispensation. The erection of the memorial, although it was paid for entirely by freed slaves, uh, the, uh, the pedestal for it uh, was paid for by a congressional appropriation. And the day uh, of its unveiling uh, had been set aside as a federal holiday, uh, a national holiday. So uh, Douglas acknowledges the federal government. He also highlights the awful sacrifice that lies behind that federal friendship. Uh, the section contains Douglas's first mention of Lincoln and he calls him the first martyr president of the United States. Moreover, Lincoln's martyrdom is presented as the climax of the larger national sacrifice to which Douglas alludes with his reference to yonder heights of Arlington. Arlington Cemetery was visible from Lincoln Park. There were 16,000 Civil War soldiers buried there, including 1,500 Black troops. So on the 11th anniversary of Lincoln's death, what Douglas wanted to remind his audience of was what he calls blood-bought freedom, our blood-bought freedom, in which we, the colored people, rejoice. While Douglas emphasizes the sentiment of appreciation that gives rise to monuments, like the one being unveiled, curiously, he says next to nothing about the actual statue. And it's actually known that he was not altogether pleased with the design. Uh, and if you've been following all of the recent attacks on uh, various monuments and statues, you know that this statue, the Freedmen's Memorial, uh, has come under attack. So uh, if you've seen pictures of it, what, what it shows is Lincoln, Emancipation Proclamation in one hand, standing sort of next to and over the half crouching, half rising figure of a slave. Now, dissatisfaction with the, uh, uh, with the statue was apparently not limited to Douglas. Uh, it was shared by other African-Americans and the official program for the festivities attempted to address these objections. Uh, it had a paragraph explaining that, quote, in the original design, the kneeling slave was represented as perfectly passive, receiving freedom from the hand of the great liberator. But the artist justly changed this to bring the presentation nearer to the historical fact by making the emancipated slave an agent in his own deliverance. He is accordingly represented as exerting his own strength with strained muscles in breaking the chain which had bound him. Now, the brochure also mentions uh, that there was an alternative design uh, by a female sculptor uh, named Harriet Hosmer. Uh, it had to be rejected as too costly, but it would have depicted Lincoln atop a central pillar flanked by smaller pillars showing, among other figures, Black Union soldiers. Uh, remember, by, uh, by the end of the war, there were 180,000 Black troops and 20% of the Union forces were African-American. Uh, now, I think Douglas would certainly have preferred that design. Uh, it would have embodied his favorite aphorism. Uh, he was in speech after speech, he would quote from Lord Byron uh, these lines, hereditary bondsmen, know ye not who would be free themselves must strike the blow. So part of what I wanna argue is that uh, Douglas's speech uh, in a way corrects the statue. Uh, whatever there is of submissiveness or paternalism in the statue uh, is corrected by Douglas, uh, particularly through his acknowledging both our loyal, brave and patriotic soldiers 
and the vast high and preeminent services rendered to ourselves, to our race, to our country, and to the whole world by Abraham Lincoln. Uh, in other words, Douglas's praise of Lincoln is balanced by his recognition of the Black contribution to emancipation. All right, so he spent the opening two sections uh, proclaiming the generous deed of the moment, uh, commending it to the notice of men of all parties and opinions, uh, including, he says, those who despise us. Then Douglas in the third section begins to speak to that larger nationwide audience, an audience of fellow citizens not all of whom are necessarily friends. And that word friend <laughs> now drops out of uh, his, uh, his uh, direct address. Right? He's just addressing fellow citizens, not all of whom are friends. Douglas now treads very carefully. He does not want the black embrace of Lincoln <laughs> to trigger a white flight from Lincoln. And so he quite dramatically backs away from the great emancipator, insisting that, quote, Abraham Lincoln was not, in the fullest sense of the word, either our man or our model in his interests, in his associations, in his habits of thought, and in his prejudices, he was a white man. He was preeminently the white man's president, entirely devoted to the welfare of white men. He was ready and willing at any time during the last years of his administration to deny, postpone, and sacrifice the rights of humanity in the colored people to promote the welfare of the white people of his country. The race to which we belong were not the special objects of his consideration. Knowing this, I concede to you, my white fellow citizens, a preeminence in this worship at once full and supreme. You are the children of Abraham Lincoln. Okay, I'm kind of smiling. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Douglas devotes the whole of section three to reassuring nervous whites, whites who are patriotic, but probably prejudiced. Basically, he tells them, look, don't worry, Lincoln always loved you best. Take it from me, a Negro, Lincoln was not a Negro lover. It's a rather startling rhetorical gambit but it allowed Douglas to exhort white Americans to heap high their hosannas of Lincoln. He tells them, quote, to you, it, belong, it especially belongs to sound his praises, to preserve and perpetuate his memory, to multiply his statues, to hang his pictures on your walls, commend his example, for to you, whites, he was a great and glorious friend and benefactor. Now, by the close of this third section, uh, which we might dub the white supremacist section, one might wonder why Blacks are bothering to honor Lincoln at all. If Lincoln is preeminently the white man's president. Why have Blacks gathered and erected this monument? Douglas's answer is that while whites are Lincoln's children, Blacks are his stepchildren, children by adoption, children by force of circumstances and necessity. Moreover, what Lincoln did for his stepchildren, whether it was part of his original intention or not, was deliver them from bondage. Accordingly, Douglas entreats whites to despise not the humble offering of former slaves. The separate claims of whites and blacks upon the memory of Lincoln can coexist. Whites can honor Lincoln for saving the Union. Blacks can honor him for emancipation. 
shared tribute, shared homage, if it is ever to develop, must begin with toleration for racially specific homage. Frederick Douglass had a gift for metaphor. And I think this image of blacks as Lincoln's stepchildren is one of his finest. It actually accords very nicely with Lincoln's own account of the relationship between the cause of union and the cause of emancipation. Uh, probably the uh, clearest expression that Lincoln gives to that comes in that famous letter to Horace Greeley. Uh, and here is how Lincoln explained his duty as president. Quote, my paramount object in this struggle is to save the union and is not either to save or to destroy slavery. If I could save the union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. So Frederick Douglass reminds his listeners that Lincoln was a unionist first and foremost, and that he became the great emancipator only by force of circumstances and necessity. Whites ought to revere Lincoln as the savior of the nation. And indeed, uh, if you think of the inscription on the national Lincoln Memorial, which was built a half a century after the Freedmen's Memorial, that inscription reads, in this temple, as in the hearts of the people for whom he saved the Union, the memory of Abraham Lincoln is enshrined forever. Now, of course, the Union to which Lincoln was devoted had at its foundation, the principle of human equality. The union was itself a moral project. Because the bond of genuine union is a teaching about natural right, American patriotism ought to produce citizens who are, as Douglas says, friendly to the freedom of all men. And in the fourth and central section of the speech, Douglas presents at greater length the stepchildren's view of Lincoln, the essential feature of which was faith in Lincoln's living and earnest sympathy with their fate. Again, Douglas doesn't paper over the disagreements, uh, the disappointments that Blacks experienced during the war years. We were, he admits, at times stunned, grieved, and greatly bewildered. Douglas provides a litany of reasons why Blacks might have doubted Lincoln's goodwill. Uh, Lincoln supported colonization schemes. Lincoln refused to enlist Black troops. Uh, after he finally allowed Black recruitment, he refused to retaliate when the Confederates violated the rules of warfare by massacring Black prisoners, Black prisoners of war. Uh, Lincoln revoked early emancipation decrees by his generals in the field. Nonetheless, Douglas asserts, quote, we were able to take a comprehensive view of Abraham Lincoln, a view that took the measure of a man. And after factoring in the logic of, it, of events, and even Douglas says that divinity that shapes our ends, Douglas says, we came to the conclusion that the hour and the man of our redemption had met in the person of Abraham Lincoln. Douglas then gives a counter litany. Uh, and there are nine things in both lists. First, there are sort of nine complaints that Blacks uh, entertained of Lincoln during the war years. And then there is a listing, a counter listing of nine liberationists and racially transformative policies that occurred during Lincoln's administration. 
uh, those nine achievements culminate in the Emancipation Proclamation. Each time, Douglas repeats a version of the phrase, under his rule we saw. Under his rule we saw. I think the phrase is intended to be uh, crucial for both blacks and whites. Blacks who longed for liberty, but who might understandably be suspicious of rule and law. They had suffered under generations of misrule. They are being reminded that their liberty came to them through law and through wise and beneficent rule. Conversely, whites are reminded that the actions of Lincoln, which struck not only at slavery, but at prejudice as well, at proscription as well, that those actions were the actions of a dedicated constitutionalist. The Constitution properly understood requires such actions. So the closing paragraph then of section four celebrates emancipation and moreover shows that the celebration can be shared by all. Douglas asks, can any colored man or any white man friendly to the freedom of all men ever forget the night which followed the first day of January, 1863? the day on which the final Emancipation Proclamation is announced and took effect. So by this point in the speech now, Douglas has shown that whites can appreciate black liberation and blacks can appreciate white statesmanship. This is a word that Douglas now uses for the first time in the address, but not the last time. On this new biracial basis of union and liberty, Douglas goes on to a reconsideration of Lincoln in the next three sections, sections uh, five, six, and seven. He argues that Lincoln's great and good character was transparent to all those who saw him and heard him. Indeed, direct contact wasn't even necessary. Uh, in a passage that I think has tremendous import for us today, Douglas says, quote, the image of the man went out with his words and those who read him knew him. We are of course indebted to biographers and historians, you know, who have scoured and scavenged, uh, scavenged uh, for all the bits and pieces of eyewitness testimony and hearsay evidence and who have laboriously contextualized and hypothesized and speculated uh, to such a degree that with the exception of Jesus, there is no one who ever walked the earth more written about than Abraham Lincoln. Nonetheless, it is very reassuring to know that Lincoln's words alone are enough. Uh, in light of this fundamentalist insight, Douglas now revises his earlier white supremacist account of Lincoln. He reconsiders Lincoln's deference to popular prejudice in the appropriate context the context of democratic statesmanship. Here's what he says at the close of section five. Uh, fairly long passage, but I have some water first. Can you all actually hear me? I feel like I'm underwater. <laughs> Here's the, uh, the passage from Douglas. I have said that President Lincoln was a white man and shared the prejudices common to his countrymen towards the colored race. Looking back to his times and to the condition of the country, this unfriendly feeling on his part may safely be set down as one element of his wonderful success in organizing the loyal American people for the tremendous conflict before them. 
and bringing them safely through that conflict. His great mission was to accomplish two things. First, to save his country from dismemberment and ruin. And second, to free his country from the great crime of slavery. To do one or the other or both, he must have the earnest sympathy and the powerful cooperation of his loyal fellow countrymen. Without this primary and essential condition to success, his efforts must have been vain and utterly fruitless. Had he put the abolition of slavery before the salvation of the Union, he would have inevitably driven from him a powerful class of the American people and rendered resistance to rebellion impossible. Viewed from the genuine abolition ground, Mr. Lincoln seemed tardy, cold, dull, and indifferent. But measuring him by the sentiment of his country, a sentiment he was bound as a statesman to consult, he was swift, zealous, radical, and determined. Now, Frederick Douglass himself always occupied the genuine abolition ground. And his speeches and writings from the early years of the war especially often manifested great frustration with Lincoln's caution. In retrospect, however, Douglass generously acknowledges the partiality of his own abolitionist stance. And he credits Lincoln as the comprehensive statesman. The final paragraph of this section carefully distinguishes Lincoln's views on race from his views on slavery. Now Douglas repeats for the third time that Lincoln was prejudiced uh, or more precisely, that he, quote, shared the prejudices of his white fellow countrymen against the Negro. According to Douglas, I think, racial prejudice is a social construct. There's nothing innate or inevitable about it. It seems that Douglas did not regard Lincoln as particularly progressive on the question of race. He was a follower or sharer in the dominant opinion of the day. However, in this very same section in which Douglas refers to Lincoln's prejudices, he explicitly says that the humblest could approach him and feel at home in his presence. And this statement echoes what Douglas said elsewhere about the experience of being in Lincoln's personal presence. Uh, speaking of his second meeting with, uh, with Lincoln, Douglas in his autobiography says, Mr. Lincoln was not only a great president, but a great man, too great to be small in anything. In his company, I was never in any way reminded of my humble origin or of my unpopular color. So we might wonder whether the presentation of Lincoln's racial prejudice is compatible with the presentation of his capacious and welcoming humanity. Now, it might be possible for someone to regard a particular class of people as inferior in certain respects, while still treating individual members of that class with consideration. In other words, Lincoln could have been both prejudiced and polite. If so, though, it would still be necessary to explain why Douglas in the oration chooses to draw attention to one quality more than the other. Perhaps he wishes to indicate to both blacks and whites that racial prejudice is not an insuperable obstacle to black advancement 
or to bettered race relations. You can begin from that point and improve. Alternatively, I believe it's possible to interpret Douglas's remarks in a way consistent with the view that Lincoln deferred to popular prejudice without fully subscribing to that popular prejudice. So the issue might be elucidated by asking, what was the nature of Lincoln's sharing in white prejudice? When he describes the relation between Lincoln and the sentiment of his country, Douglas credits Lincoln with being in advance of popular opinion, right? Measured against which he was swift, zealous, radical, and determined. Douglas introduces the key verb consult, claiming that the sentiment of his country was something that Lincoln was bound as a statesman to consult. To the extent that popular sentiment was unfriendly to Blacks, Lincoln sharing in it may have been political rather than personal. In other words, deliberately affected rather than deeply held. And Douglas here conveys uh, a crucial lesson about the limits within which democratic statesmen operate. Politicians can't get too far ahead of public opinion if they hope to remain politically viable. And more than others, perhaps, black citizens must incorporate this insight into their assessment of political figures. A comprehensive view must, quoting here from Douglas, make reasonable allowance for the circumstances and not judge on the basis of, quote, stray utterances or, quote, isolated facts. In taking the measure of Lincoln, Douglas shows how granting this latitude of maneuver uh, is compatible with respect for the burdens of statesmanship, as well as the self-respect of citizens. Now, however one might come down on this question of Lincoln's views on race, uh, and we'd have to do a lot more work and read a lot more from Lincoln uh, in order to get a, a final answer on this. Uh, but however you come down on that question, Douglas is emphatic that Lincoln's attitude towards slavery was above reproach. Douglas quotes uh, from what I call the atonement passage of the second inaugural, uh, in which Lincoln interprets the Civil War as the blood price exacted by a just God for the sin of American slavery. Um, everybody know the, know the passage from the, the second inaugural, the one I'm talking about? Uh, where Lincoln speaks of the, the war as possibly continuing until all the wealth piled by the bondsman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword. Uh, those were lines that Douglas quoted in nearly every post-war speech that he gave that mentioned Lincoln. For the next 30 years, whenever he mentions Lincoln in a speech, he quotes that atonement passage. Uh, the second inaugural solemn invocation of divine reparations, Douglas says, gives all needed proof of Lincoln's feeling on the subject of slavery. Uh, I might also just mention that if you do the math there, uh, remember Lincoln gives that second inaugural in 1865. He mentions 250 years of unrequited toil. Uh, if you do the math, you get to 1615, uh, which is a pretty, uh, he's, he's pretty much accurate uh, that uh, 1619 is a significant date for Americans. Uh, I actually consider the second inaugural to be the original and better 1619 project. Uh, so uh, Douglas now revisits an issue 
uh, that he had highlighted earlier. In section three, remember when he mentioned Lincoln's policy uh, of opposition to the extension of slavery, he had stressed Lincoln's willingness to protect, defend, and perpetuate slavery in the states where it existed, right? Remember, Lincoln was opposed to the extension of slavery into the territories with this policy dispute about, about the extension of slavery. But Lincoln always said that, you know, the Constitution doesn't allow us to do anything about slavery in the slave states. Uh, and in the earlier section of Douglass's speech, that tolerance of slavery in the South was cited as evidence of Lincoln's pro-white views. But now, in section five, Douglas explains that Lincoln acted as he did, not because he was indifferent to the fate of black slaves, but quote, because he thought it was so nominated in the bond. In other words, he acted out of fidelity to the constitution that was nominated in the bond. So Lincoln's pre-war willingness to leave slavery alone in the Southern states does not in any way disprove or lessen his anti-slavery convictions. Douglas himself disagreed with Lincoln about what precisely was nominated in the bond. Uh, most, most notably, uh, Douglas argued that the so-called fugitive slave clause of the Constitution did not, in fact, refer to slaves, but rather to indentured servants who had signed contracts and could be held to those legal terms. Uh, Douglas argued that everything about that supposed fugitive slave clause uh, as, assumes the existence uh, of a contract. And you know, slaves, slaves have not signed contracts. Uh, nonetheless, even though he, even though Douglas is not fully in accord with Lincoln's reading of the document, Douglas moves his audience towards an appreciation of constitutional de devotion. Uh, Douglas is acutely aware that racial progress in the future is going to depend upon fidelity to the Constitution. Both blacks and whites are going to have to keep faith with the Constitution. The Constitution as purified and corrected by the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. All right, that brings us up to uh, sections six and seven. Uh, and those sections transcend race altogether. These are the only sections that make no reference to either whites or blacks. Section six describes Lincoln's early years, his preparation through plain speaking and plain dealing for the great crisis of the Civil War. Uh, Douglas emphasizes Lincoln's humble origins, uh, a son of toil himself. He was linked in brotherly sympathy with the sons of toil in every loyal part of the Republic. So in this section, what happens is that the racial division is overcome and it's replaced by the class division between the patrician James Buchanan, who was willing to allow national dismemberment, and the plebeian Abraham Lincoln, who had an oath in heaven to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So in other words, what uh, I think Douglas is suggesting is that the division we ought to pay attention to is the division between patriotism and treason. Uh, and that theme reaches its apotheosis in section seven. Uh, section seven describes the assassination of Lincoln, despite the hell black spirit of revenge that motivated the crime, Douglas argues that good has come from it. This very uh, characteristic feature of Douglas's thought. Uh, he always sees good coming out of, uh, out of evil. Uh, dying as a martyr to union and liberty, those twin aims now conjoined and equal, Lincoln has become doubly dear to us. Uh, in his autobiography, Douglas noted that one effect of the assassination was to bring him into close accord with his white neighbors. Uh, he said he felt for the first time that he was more like kin than countrymen. 
In the final section of the speech, uh, which is just one paragraph in length, Douglas comes full circle, speaking once more to his largely black audience. He tells them in doing honor to the memory of our friend and liberator, we have been doing highest honor to ourselves and those who come after us. Note that despite the unfriendly feeling that had been ascribed to Lincoln in section three and in section five, Lincoln by the end has become our friend. Through his interpretation uh, and masterful presentation of Lincoln's statesmanship, Douglas has knit together the American polity in mutual understanding uh, and mutual appreciation of Lincoln. Douglas has acted as a statesman himself by demonstrating how memory and memorialization done well might shape a post-racial future. Uh, in conclusion, uh, I'll just to say a word uh, about the larger lesson to be drawn from this speech. Frederick Douglass uh, is best known as an activist. Uh, much of his speaking and writing involved demands for justice, justice towards blacks, justice towards women, justice towards laborers. Uh, a famous story of Douglass being approached, uh, a very old elderly Douglass uh, being approached by a young man asking what he should do for the cause of racial justice and Douglas is said to have answered, agitate, agitate, agitate. But this fabled agitator also devoted a goodly portion of his public speaking to commemorating the past, celebrating the founding ideals of the nation, praising citizens and public figures who remained faithful to both the Declaration and the Constitution. In other words, he tried to foster a spirit of friendship, to foster a unified national consciousness. Uh, Aristotle, I get the impression that you folks all still read Aristotle, right? Uh, Aristotle, the first political scientist, called this homonoia, like-mindedness, like-mindedness, thinking the same, about certain crucial matters is the form of friendship that should characterize fellow citizens. Uh, Aristotle calls this like-mindedness the greatest of goods for the political order. It lessens civic strife among the parts or parties that are always present in any larger collective. Diversity without the foundation of like-mindedness is a recipe for growing discord. Like-mindedness allows cooperation and trust to replace contentiousness and suspicion. Aristotle argued that lawmakers should pursue this sort of friendship more than justice even, since civic friendship leads to justice and does so without having to involve the coercive bite of the law. In friendship, what is right and what is pleasing come naturally together. For a model of how to encourage this civic friendship, there are few who equal Frederick Douglass. Uh, let me just leave you with his picture of the American future. Uh, in 1863, he looked forward to a time when, quote, the white and colored people of this country will be blended into a common nationality and enjoy together in the same country under the same flag, the inestimable blessings of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as neighborly citizens of a common country. Uh, happy to uh, talk to respondent tonight. Uh, she needs no introduction. At the University of Dallas, Dr. Susan Hansen, who's chair of the history department, uh, will now give a, a response to Dr. Shove's presentation. I want to make uh, absolutely clear that 
This is a response uh, drawing out a couple of points from the speech and trying to connect it to the core text um, that you dears all read from Frederick Douglass. Um, it's not a rebuttal. <laughs> um, and I want to say that only uh, the, the noble spirit of patriotism and deference to my colleague, Chris Wolf, um, would get me to comply with the, the mask um, requirement. <laughs> and I will revenge myself on all of you for having me here with a mask tomorrow um, when I escape from jail. So um, um, I would invite you, um, you know, I wouldn't usually invite you to go online, right? Um, but to uh, just very quickly look up on your phones, um, if you haven't um, seen it, the picture of the Freedmen's Memorial um, that Frederick Douglass was speaking about, um, he was in the unveiling of this Freedmen's Memorial. I imagine that Max Valentine here in the front row doesn't need to look up a picture of it because he lives on Capitol Hill. Um, and I imagine maybe over the summer you experienced some of the um, distaste for the, yes, yes, okay, thought so. Professor Schaub has given us a beautiful model of close reading, taking as her text Frederick Douglass's oration on the unveiling of the Freedmen's Memorial in 1876. I wanted you to, to look at it um, for yourself. I think that um, over the summer, this, um, this memorial, this sculpture um, has become one of the many images that people would consider a kind of triggering image. Right? Um, the Freedmen's Memorial paid for and commissioned by freed slaves, which has been a place of annual gatherings to celebrate emancipation has become controversial since the 1960s. And even more so this summer in 2020, in the midst of the destruction of memorials and monuments in protest of America's history of racism. The image of a paternalistic Lincoln liberating a submissive slave is viewed by many as offensive to the spirit of just equality that ought to characterize American civic culture. Professor Schaub notes that Frederick Douglass used a line from Byron that seemed to hit back at the visual portrayal of the passivity of slaves in their act of emancipation. Byron in his famous celebration of modern Greece's independence from the Ottoman Turk empire, wrote hereditary bondsmen, know ye not, who would be free themselves must strike the blow. Nevertheless, while she notes that Frederick Douglass had a different design for the memorial in mind and may have had reservations about the final sculpture, Professor Schaub notes that Frederick Douglass gave his assent to the visual image by rhetorically incorporating it into his speech. Douglas repeated as a refrain throughout his speech, almost as in a Methodist line in him after each of the nine verses that listed Lincoln's achievements culminating in the Emancipation Proclamation. The phrase, under his rule we saw, under his rule we saw, under his rule we saw. Douglas thus acknowledged a debt of gratitude to Lincoln because through what didn't, Douglas called white statesmanship, slavery in America came to an end through law and through wise and benevolent rule. Douglas had come around, made a complete 180 degree shift from William Lloyd Garrison's rejection of the United States Constitution as drenched in the blood of slaves to Lincoln's view that the Constitution itself is a glorious liberty document and that American civilization even white American civilization with all its heritage of thought from the classical and Christian world had within it the resources to recognize the moral, social, political and economic evil of slavery and to bring about the end of slavery. The other line that Professor Schaub draws our attention to as a striking testimony to Lincoln's personal character and as particularly representative of Douglas's mature and comprehensive view of Lincoln is his insistence that the humblest could, could approach him and feel at home in his presence. This line also interprets the visual image in words and colors a reception of the image. Most students at the University of Dallas read a different text of Frederick Douglass as part of our core curriculum. So let me just take a moment to connect the dots between the text that Professor Schaub has analyzed for us. Um, that's uh, probably a very rich 50 minutes. Um, if you guys are used to Monday, Wednesday, Friday classes, you probably felt like the past 50 minutes was a, a you know, a kind of really rich Monday, Wednesday, Friday class, right? That you could probably ponder for the rest of the semester. Um, 
but to connect the dots between that and the narrative life of a slave. Um, how many of you have already purchased this at the bookstore because you're an AMSIV and you know that you need to read it in the next two weeks? Um, okay, so we've got about six people um, in possession of the book in this room. Um, it's Douglas's memoir of his life in slavery and his escape to freedom. What is striking is the central act, is that the central act of Douglas's escape from slavery to freedom is precisely learning to read. And he learns to articulate his natural sense of his human dignity and right to political equality by reading, memorizing, and imitating great speeches of the past. Precisely what we just engaged in, right? Reading, right? engaging with, right? learning from a great speaker of the past, Frederick Douglass in his oration. He writes that reading addresses this is what we do in Thucydides, right? Um, those of you who've been on the Rome, Rome campus with Peter Hatley, right? reading Thucydides, right? Where it's a little bit of war and a great speech and a little bit of war and a great speech and a little bit of war and a great speech, right? Um, and you learn to interpret political speech, to be a close reader of political speech. Douglas writes that reading addresses on Catholic emancipation from Irish orators, quote, gave tongue to interesting thoughts of my own soul, which had frequently flashed through my mind and died away for want of utterance. This is a, a central passage in chapter six of the, the memoir. He learns to read, a kindly mistress commenced to teach me the ABC. And then I'd like to read you the, the passage where you, you hear this. Um, he says, uh -huh. I was now about 12 years old, 12 years old. Just about this time, I got hold of a book entitled The Columbian Orator. Every opportunity I got, I used to read this book. Among much of other interesting matter, I found in it a dialogue between a master and his slave. That dialogue is in the handy uh, collected material at the end of this edition. So you can read what Frederick Douglass was reading as a 12 year old, as a 12 year old slave, right? Who had just been taught his ABCs by his kind mistress. Every opportunity I got, I used to read this book. Among much other interesting matter, I found in it a dialogue between a master and his slave. The slave was represented as having run away from his master three times, not passively waiting for emancipation. The dialogue represented the conversation which took place between them when the slave was retaken the third time. In this dialogue, the whole argument in behalf of slavery was brought forward by the master, all of which was disposed of by the slave. The slave was made to say some very smart as well as impressive things in reply to his master, things which had the desired though unexpected effect. For the conversation resulted in the voluntary emancipation of the slave on the part of his master. In the same book, I met with one of Sheridan's mighty speeches on and in behalf of Catholic emancipation. These were choice documents to me. I read them over and over with unabated interest. They gave tongue to interesting thoughts of my own soul, which had frequently flashed through my mind and died away for want of utterance. The moral which I gained from the dialogue was the power of truth over the conscience of even a slaveholder. The pith of Frederick Douglass's discovery was that trying to articulate one's memories, writing a confession or a memoir or an autobiography. We read this text in the, in the context of having encountered the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, later reading right, the memoirs of Henry Adams, the education of Henry Adams, series of autobiographies. Frederick Douglass's discovery was that trying to articulate one's memories, trying to sort through one's memories and articulate them in words leads to the discovery of one's own nature. 
Words capture concepts. Concepts capture the nature or essence, the whatness or quiddity of things. Yes? <laughs> Douglas begins his narrative with incredible artistry. He identifies his desire to know, his desire to know his birthday and his birthplace, a desire to know his father and his mother, a desire to speak the truth rather than to cover fear with lies. The opening lines of the narrative, chapter one, he opens up. I was born in Tuckahoe near Hillsboro, about 12 miles from Easton in Talbot County, Maryland. Max Lagarde, you're a Marylander, Talbot County. No, nope, don't know it, not that kind of a Marylander. <laughs> I was born in Tuckahoe. I have no accurate knowledge of my age, never having seen any authentic record containing it. By far the larger part of the slaves know as little of their age as horses know of theirs. And it is the wish of most masters within my knowledge to keep their slaves thus ignorant. I do not remember to have ever met a slave who could tell of his birthday. They seldom come nearer to, nearer to it than planting time, harvest time, cherry time, spring time, or fall time. A want of information concerning my own was a source of unhappiness to me even during childhood. The white children could tell their ages. I could not tell why I should be deprived of the same privileges. I was not allowed to make any inquiries of my master concerning it. He deemed all such inquiries on the part of a slave improper and impertinent and evidence of a restless spirit. Unlike a rock, unlike an annual plant that blossoms in springtime, fall time, or harvest time, unlike a horse, Douglas's earliest memory involves a desire to know, a desire to make inquiries inquiries, the word Herodotus used for his first historical narrative, inquiries about his own origins. A want of information concerning my own was a source of unhappiness to me even during childhood. And this unhappiness at not knowing his origins is his primary evidence of his humanity, his restless spirit. For any University of Dallas student who has studied on our own campus and read Augustine's Confessions in their Philosophy of the Human Person class, the word restless in the opening paragraph hits home like a fiery arrow. Our hearts are restless, O Lord, until they rest in thee. Augustine opens his own memoir with these words. Professor Schaub ended her lecture with Douglas's confidence that memory and memorialization has the power to shape the future. Exploring our own personal and our own national memory leads to questions about nature and questions of origins, existential questions about the material, formal, efficient, and final causes of our own being, the alpha and omega, for what purpose we have been called out of darkness into this marvelous light of being. Oblivion of the past, the erasure of memory, cancels existential questioning enslaving us in a spatial and temporal here and now, the present fleeting moment in which our only relations are egalitarian and temporary relations with those who share our weakness, but no more stable relation to the author of our being who alone has kept the record of existential origin. Thomas Aquinas, we're gonna escape an evening at the University of Dallas without reference to Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> Thomas Aquinas argued that there is no greater anthropological error than to argue that the soul is produced by generation. The human person, rational and restless, is not a species animal, is not a racial animal. Each and every human person is an individual image of God. Professor Schaub has pointed out that Booker T. Washington would say that racial bigots are to be pitied because they are in a more devastating form of slavery, ignorance of their own origin, not in species generation, but direct from the hand of God. Thank you.
hopefully we can have questions. Questions now. Uh, anybody has questions about either the specifics of Dr. Schaub's lecture or more generally about Lincoln, uh, Douglas, perhaps the bearing of those uh, those men on discussions today as well? Burns. Wait, wait! Don't don't student questions come first? <laughs> That means one of you has to ask a question, otherwise we're signing, right? I'm prepared to wait. <laughs> You're going to have to shout a whole lot. Of... You mentioned that Frederick Douglass was capable of changing his views on yeah. Abraham Lincoln. Do we also see an evolution of views on black people from President Lincoln, or did he remain fairly consistent throughout his life? Uh, yeah, very, very good question. Uh, Can you repeat the question just for the Yeah, um, uh, we, we've seen that Douglas is open minded enough to reconsider his views and change his position. Uh, do we see any equivalent on the part of Lincoln, uh, particularly with respect to does he change his opinion about, about black folks? Okay. Um, I think. There is a view that uh, has become pretty common that what you see in Lincoln is an evolution of his views, uh, that he begins, you know, as a sharer in white prejudice, uh, particularly people note that he was in favor of colonization. Uh, he, at a certain point during the Civil War, he stops mentioning colonization as a possibility. Uh, he's initially resistant to allowing uh, Blacks into the Union Army. He eventually agrees to do that. Many people argue that the performance of Black soldiers was important in yeah, uh, provoking a kind of reconsideration on his part. Uh, we know that in the 1850s, he says, you know, I'm not recommending political and social equality. I'm just trying to prevent slavery from spreading into the territories because slavery is wrong, but that doesn't mean we have to embrace uh, full political equality. Uh, and yet by the end of the war, uh, especially in that last speech that he gives, the speech that, uh, that uh, causes John Wilkes Booth to decide upon uh, assassination, what Lincoln came out in favor of there was uh, the first steps towards uh, the vote for African Americans. Uh, he recommended a, a qualified suffrage. Uh, he also, we know, wrote private letters to the governor of uh, Louisiana. Uh, Louisiana, remember, was one of the first states to be reconstructed. And he uh, made the suggestion to the new free state governor of Louisiana to consider the vote for African Americans. So it looks like a kind of evolving trajectory. Um, I actually disagree with that. <laughs> um, and part of my reasons for doing so come through in this, in this speech. Uh, in the 1850s, uh, Lincoln is very aware of the limits on political maneuver set by public opinion. He is in Illinois. Illinois is a free state, but it is the most anti-Black of all of the free states. Uh, there, is, there, are, there are laws on the books uh, that make it very difficult for free Blacks to even transit the state, right? much less move, in, move into the state. Uh, so uh, in order to maintain any kind of political viability in the 1850s, uh, Lincoln has to uh, assert that he, he's, he's, you know, he's not considering uh, political equality. But at the same time, if you, if you read those speeches carefully, uh, like the Peoria address, uh, there's an incredible moment where he says, uh, you know, what does consent of the governed mean? Uh, it means, you know, allow all the governed a voice and that and that only is self-government. He's explicating the meaning of the self-evident truths of the declaration. And he makes perfectly clear there that, uh, that so long as Blacks remain in the United States post-slavery, uh, we, uh, we will have to move in the direction of full political equality. Right after he says that, 
he immediately backpedals and he says, no, 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 uh, you know, I've already said uh, that I'm not, uh, you know, not recommending uh, political equality. He says, I am not now combating the argument based on, uh, on necessity. I am not now. So it seems to me that Lincoln is always aware of what the end point is for the American polity. And he, he, he is constantly reshaping and informing and transforming public opinion. So he is always one step ahead of public opinion, but never officially more than one step ahead of public opinion. So it seems to me the, the sequence of policy positions uh, is, is, doesn't have to be reflective of a change in his own heart or his own, uh, his own understanding of things. Uh, but it is the carefully calibrated politician, uh, you know, gradually moving, uh, moving America in that direction. Um, judging from his dinner speech and uh, little louder, sorry. Judging from uh, Frederick Douglass's keynote speech and like other works, um, do you think if he had the opportunity, he would have removed the statue and replaced it with something else? Ah, uh, ah, uh, good. Uh, that's not a good question. Um, yeah, let me uh, let me just say a little bit more, maybe about the statue first, uh, and then what I think Douglas would recommend today. Uh, I actually gave a speech uh, over the summer at the memorial, uh, a group that was organizing to try to save the memorial. Um, I actually think there's a little more to the uh, to the statue than uh, our sort of initial. I don't know. You know, when you, when you first look at it, you know, it looks too much like uh, the great white Moses. You know, Lincoln and blacks as just you know lesser and passive recipients. So the optics of it, right? It looks like you know just benefaction and gratitude, and that sort of violates our notions of liberty and equality. Uh, what that should look like. Um, but the grouping is entitled emancipation. And I think that's crucial. In other words, the monument is not a depiction of freedom. It's a depiction of the transition to freedom. It's a change of status that's made possible by Lincoln's executive order, by the Emancipation Proclamation. And the statue actually captures something true about that in-between state. Uh, think of the term that we use, the freedman. Not free man, but the, but the former slaves were called freedmen, right? They've been freed, but they are not yet free men in full. And that I think is why the depiction of the slave, he's not kneeling, but he's not standing either. He's in a half risen posture. He's poised on the brink of possibility. So the statue acknowledges that emancipation by law right, or under law is, is only the beginning, right? the beginning of an arduous journey. So also note the freedman is not looking up at Lincoln, you know, beseechingly. Uh, he's not looking at Lincoln at all. He's not a supplicant. His gaze is fixed forward. Right? Lincoln is offering the Emancipation Proclamation, but the, but the freedman's gaze is fixed forward, eyes on the prize. Right? He sees the vast future ahead of himself and ahead of his people. Uh, so these widened prospects that he has are a result of the Emancipation Proclamation, but he's intent on his own self-realization, his own agency. Uh, and then I think there's, there's sort of another element too, and that's that, you know, the depiction of Lincoln, right? So most of the dissatisfaction focuses on the depiction of the slave. Uh, but there's, uh, I think, a lot to be noted about the depiction of Lincoln as well. He's holding the Emancipation Proclamation in one hand, and the other hand rests on a plinth, all of these great terms, you know, <laughs> related to statuary, a plinth. Uh, containing symbols of the nation. So there's a cameo of George Washington. Uh, there's a shield and stars. Those represent law, government, the nation's founding. Behind Lincoln is a whipping 
post. And the whipping post is covered over in drapery. So I think the artist is reminding us there was the old way, the whipping post, and there's the promise of a new way. An enslaved people lives under the lash. A free people lives under law. In moving from one to the other, we don't forget the horrors of the past. Right? And we don't forget the lingering legacy of that past. And so it seems to me the statue is honest about that. Uh, it celebrates the new birth of freedom, but it, it doesn't deny the nation's injustice, that long injustice. So even as the chain has been broken off, so the slave is sort of half rising, breaking these chains. So the chains are at his feet, but the cuffs are still on the wrists. Uh, and that too is honest. Right? The new order of the law allows for the freedman's rising, but that effort to wrench himself away from his former constrained uh, conditions, uh, that's going to take longer. That's going to require ongoing effort and will on the on the freedman's part, right? And therefore, his fists are clenched, and his his muscles are straining. Uh, so to think about this today, then. So, in other words, I uh, the reason to maintain the statue there is not only its history. You know, the fact that this is the. the first act of the freed slaves, you know, their hard earned money. I mean, it, it would just be a, a, a travesty, it seems, to the memory of what they sacrificed to put up that statue uh, if we were to tear it down or even, you know, move it to a museum. But I, I think the more serious reason to keep it there is because it says something true uh, about, uh, about that moment. Uh, and I guess what I think should be done uh, is that it should be, that statue should be surrounded with a, a new sculpture garden. Uh, and that sculpture garden should pay tribute to the achievements of African-Americans uh, in all fields of endeavor. In other words, what we should do is follow the gaze of Archer Alexander. Uh, that's, that's the slave on which the, uh, he served as the model for the for the statue, for the statue of the slave. We should follow his gaze uh, and you know, there should be statues to uh, African-American uh, contributions in the arts and the sciences, in music and politics, uh, in athletics and literature. Uh, so in other words, uh, the display of gratitude for the act of emancipation, which that statue embodies, that could then become a showplace uh, of the value of black liberation for all Americans. Uh, and it seems to me that's, uh, that's what, uh, what Douglas would have wanted as well. There's been an interesting discovery of a, of a letter uh, that Douglas wrote to a newspaper about the statue where he pretty much says that. He says he hopes a time will come when more statues will be built. So we don't, we don't need to tear that one down. We need to, we need to add to it. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that Frederick Douglass believed that Lincoln was uh, subverting the cause of African American freedom for the cause of the Union. He believed the Union was greater. Do you think that Lincoln prioritized the Union for political reasons because he was president and he thought it was a duty, or for philosophical reasons because he believed it was the greater cause? Ah. Yeah, that's also a very good question. Uh, it, I mean, it's it's the first thing you say is certainly true. Uh, it was part of his duty. It was his understanding of his duty. He had taken an oath to the Constitution uh, and to the maintenance of the Union. So yes, he does. Even even though he says it's his personal wish that all men everywhere might be free, uh, he is not at liberty as president to do whatever the heck he wants right, to realize that personal wish. Uh, his duty is to the oath, which is registered in heaven, he says. Uh, I guess in a way, I, so, so yes, he subordinates uh, the cause of abolition to the cause of union. 
But when it turns out to be the case that the only way to save the union is to end slavery, right? That's when the two things come together for him. But I, I guess I would just add to that, and I and I think I mentioned it in here that for Lincoln, the union is a moral project. It has moral content. So it's not just <laughs> that 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 oath is is. I don't, know, I, don't know, I don't know, I'm struggling to say this somehow, but um, there's a letter in which Lincoln says that, uh, you know, if we just, if we just go the Kansas Nebraska Act, if we just allow slavery to spread, if the result of slavery spreading leads to the reinauguration of the international slave trade, uh, if it eventually culminates in the nationalization of slavery. That's what, Lincoln would, that's what Lincoln thought. That would be the ultimate trajectory of the nation if you allowed slavery to spread into the territories. It would lead to the nationalization of slavery everywhere. The free states would themselves become slave states. Uh, he says, if, if that happens, he says at that point, uh, you know, I'm just gonna move to Russia where I can take my despotism straight and without the base alloy of hypocrisy. So Lincoln could imagine, uh, you know, if the, if the union was no longer a moral project, if that moral content were lost, if we repudiate our founding ideals, right, if we reject the notion that all men are created equal, uh, yeah, then... Uh, he, he, could, he could imagine his allegiance to it uh, withering away. So, so I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that at some deeper level, there, there is an inextricable link between the cause of union and the cause of abolition, the abolition of slavery. Is that... Oh, let, all right. Let the court, let one more student over here. Okay. Uh, so, this U Douglas hat that they needed to grab food. Sorry, can't, cannot hear you. This, this U Douglas hat that they needed uh, gratitude and you know, like a blind justice instead of pity and benevolence. Yeah. They went out in this case that you gave, but did it went out in the reconstruction effort in general or how? Uh, well, um, yes, in a, in a sense, because you do get the 14th and 15th Amendments. Uh, and Douglas was one of the prime movers in uh, bringing about the 15th Amendment in particular. Um, and his argument there is very interesting. He, uh, he believed that the nation had been chastised in other words, he believed what Lincoln argued in the second inaugural, that the war was divine punishment for the sin of slavery. And he thought that many Americans accepted and understood the war in that way. And he says they were uh, you know, disposed to learn righteousness. And so he thought the moment was ripe to really capitalize on that and push for full justice push for political equality, the 15th Amendment. He seemed to uh, have an inkling that America would probably uh, not stay true to that. Uh, and, you know, he lived until 1895, so he saw the backsliding. Uh, he saw the abandonment. Um, but he still believed that it was important to get that into the Constitution. Uh, partly because by that point, you know, he had become such a fan of the Constitution as a glorious liberty document. And if you have the principle clearly stated, then you have a weapon uh, with which to hold the nation, you know, responsible to hold the nation to that. Uh, yeah, but I mean, he, he did continue to be worried about, uh, you know, just sort of benevolent societies and charity and charity taking, taking uh, 
a form that undermines initiative on the part of blacks themselves. Okay, Dr. Burns, you've been patient. Good to go now. Thank you, thank you for calling on the students first. Um, you read some striking formulation, but I don't remember in detail. After section three or four, it was something to the effect of <laughs> racial reconciliation presupposes, and I don't remember if it was recognition of racial difference, or I, I forget how you put it, but you were drawing on this, this, this discussion of the Black men's appreciation for Abraham Lincoln as distinct from the white men's appreciation for Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. And that's the sort of thing that today one is more likely to hear from the political left than the political right. The, the emphasis on acknowledgement of racial difference uh, as, a as a precondition for harmony. And as somebody who's not known as a critical race theorist yourself, I was just wondering if you could say what, if anything, we today could have to learn from whatever that insight was exactly as you, as you formulated it. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think I remember what I said. So you know, let me try to, to restate that. Um, I, I think that Douglas says you begin from separate appreciation, okay? So whites will appreciate Lincoln for the union, blacks will appreciate Lincoln for emancipation. And so he says we, we have to have toleration for that separate appreciation. And so he says, okay, we've got our memorial here, which is entitled Emancipation. But he says, you whites, you ought to build a whole bunch of monuments to Lincoln too. Right? And those will all be about the union, saving the union, and that's fine. But it does seem to me that the trajectory of the speech, that he eventually, he, he's really trying to shift the audience to shared appreciation. And that means that, that whites will have to become appreciative of black liberation, of emancipation. And, and blacks will have to become appreciative of the union. They'll have to become patriotic uh, about the union. So, he begins from that separate appreciation, but he's trying to move the nation to shared appreciation. And it's actually very interesting. Remember the, the National Lincoln Memorial is not built, uh, uh, not the, the inauguration of it, uh, the dedication of it doesn't take place until 1922. And the keynote address uh, at that unveiling of the, of the memorial was given by uh, uh, a man by the last name of Moton. Uh, and he was actually the successor to Booker T. Washington at Tuskegee Institute. And his speech was actually about uh, a kind of transformation of the black man's debt to Lincoln becoming the nation's debt to the black man. Uh, and it's a speech about emancipation. So even though this was the national memorial, which you might have expected to be all about union, you know, think of the whole construction of the monument, or you know, the names of the 26 states, you know, around the uh, whatever the proper term for that is, the freeze or whatever at the at the top. Um, it, it it really is designed as a as a monument to union, but the keynote address was all about emancipation. So you, you, you could say that there, you, you could see that, you know, the, or, and think of the way that Lincoln Memorial is, is used now, the other significant events that have occurred there, uh, you know, King's I Have a Dream speech. Um, uh, Mar Marian Anderson's uh, performance. Right, when she wasn't allowed to sing at, at, the, at the hall in DC, instead she sings, you know, on the steps of the, the Lincoln Memorial. Susan, you want to take the last question here? Thank you. Um, so before my question, I just want to say, I really like your, your, your idea for the sculpture garden around the, the, current, uh, the current sculpture. Um, because it preserves the past and um, and builds on it instead of erasing it. And mm -hmm. the, the vision that I have um, is of this 
sculpture that was paid for and commissioned by Friedman, who actually had experienced slavery and um, and Lincoln's action being kind of put in one of those those big boxes that they put the Ark of the Covenant in at the end of the Indiana Jones movie and being put into some you know government vault, and, and that's what they're doing yeah. with our history. Uh, so I, I imagine that maybe your speech there um, would be available on YouTube for students. Of uh, I think it is. Yeah, and, it, and that, th those remarks are very short. It's like four minutes or something. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's yeah, <laughs> yeah, very short. Well, and and uh, uh, you know, by the way, there are some uh, other ideas uh, like this. Uh, you know, I'm I'm from uh, Maryland also, or at least I've been in Maryland now for th for three decades, uh, and of course. Uh, the most famous Marylander is Roger B. Tawney, you know, author of the Dred Scott decision. Uh, and there's a statue to Tawney uh, outside the state house, and there's a replica of that statue in Baltimore, or there used to be. They've now both been removed. But interestingly, the descendants of Dred Scott did not want the Tawney statue removed. They wanted uh, a statue of Dred Scott added adjacent to the to the Tawny statue, you know, with some historical plaques and description of, you know, why that case uh, was important, why it was such a travesty of, uh, uh, of justice. More historical memory rather than... Like, yeah, yeah. Um, so my, my question is... I'm sorry, there was a question. Was, yeah. Was a question. Yeah. 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 My question was about um, the, a, a kind of larger... Uh, question about the language that Frederick Douglass uses with regard to the worship of Lincoln that mm. I think is the kind of historical language that um, also may be taken on different coloring um, after the experience of the 20th century and the fascist state and um, uh, uses a lot of this language of you know, joining in this high worship, um, you know, the, the temple where he's enshrined in memory, uh, keeping high their hosannas to Lincoln, um, which is a kind of language that I, I think people nowadays would be disturbed by. And yeah. um, I, one, of, uh, one of our former faculty members, um, uh, you know, applied uh, Eric um, Boglin's concerns about hmm. modern Gnosticism in politics um, to precisely this kind of worship of Lincoln. Um, and, and, and yet I find uh, reading, reading John and Abigail Adams's letters, Abigail refers at one, at one point, uh, she's concerned about John's long absence and what it's doing to their family. Um, but she acknowledges that he's taking care of a greater debt. And she says that your country is like a second god. <laughs> um, so, I mean, that's 18th century language. Mm -hmm. Then we have Frederick Douglass's uh, 19th century language. Um, how can we continue to understand uh, the debt of gratitude that we owe to our country or the, the debt of patriotism uh, after the events of the 20th century? How can we reconnect with that kind of historic language? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, I guess I would say there is the language that you've pointed to. Um, and I think that would have been, yeah, very familiar at the time and sort of conventional. And so you get that. But think also of those, you know, sentences where he says, you know, Abraham Lincoln was not our man or, or our model. You know, he was preeminently the white man's president. I mean, he says some, and of course there are some people who read the speech by only reading those passages. Uh, and they believe that, you know, Douglas was the first one to tear Lincoln down and, you know, see the feet of clay and, uh, right? So uh, I think that it's actually very sophisticated in the, the speech in, in what it's doing. And I think he's worried, remember, his people are new voters. They're new citizens and new voters. And I think he's giving a kind of lesson. I mean, he's, he's giving a warning or he, he's worried about two dangers. Uh, he doesn't want his people to look for a new Moses. And so there's no way you can read the speech and come away with that sort of view of, you know, 
Lincoln as the Moses of the black people. Uh, but he also doesn't want them to fall into the other error of just cynicism and you know, the, the dismissal uh, of, uh, of politicians. And so it seems to me he's trying to show what a balanced judgment might look like. It's an education of, uh, of, of new voters, these new black voters. Uh, with, the, with this particular difficulty that these are black voters who are always, at least so far as he can tell, uh, for the foreseeable future, going to, be, going to be assessing and voting on white politicians for the most part. Um, so that, that might also then help think about maybe a good lesson for us today too, uh, we seem to think that our past is either entirely shameful or so largely shameful that we can't, you know, be patriotic any longer. We can't, we can't subscribe uh, to those original principles, uh, or we doubt we doubt the sincerity uh, of the formulators of those principles. So here again, it seems to me that, that Douglas is really a kind of model for how to both appreciate what is good in our tradition, what there is to praise, uh, and what there is to blame. And, and he's just, he's pretty generous in doing both of those things. I mean, he really praises with generosity and he criticizes with vehemence and, uh, and sarcasm and biting mockery. You know, read that, you know, what to the slave is the 4th of July. It begins with the appreciation of the declaration and the, and the revolutionary fathers. It ends with the appreciation of the constitution as a glorious liberty document. And the whole middle of the speech is just a scathing denunciation of the sons of the fathers, the sons of the fathers who have betrayed the, the original principles. So, you know, uh, I mean, I, I think it's one of, I, I think you can make an argument. It's uh, one of the most patriotic addresses ever delivered. And on that wonderful note, mm -hmm. we'll end the evening. <laughs>